The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and to strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse any political issues or candidates. A couple of housekeeping notes. Please, before we, before we begin this event's program, uh, I would just like to remind you, please turn off any and all cell phones or anything that makes noise. And also, following tonight's remarks, we'll have a brief question and answer period. Um, the microphones are located on both sides of the aisles. Please line up if you wish to ask a question. And now for our speakers. Dr. Bill C. Martell will be moderating this discussion tonight. Dr. Martell is an Associate Professor of International Security Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. His research and teaching interests are in international security and public policy. How long have you been there? Uh, and tonight's speaker, Jonathan, Governor John Huntsman, started off his political career as a staff assistant in President Ronald Reagan's administration. He later became the ambassador to Singapore under President George H.W. Bush and later under President Bill Clinton. Under four presidents. Governor, Johnson, Governor Huntsman excuse me, extended his expertise in Asian politics by becoming the U.S. ambassador to China under President Obama. Tonight, Governor Huntsman is here to speak about on a topic which directly relates to his experiences as an ambassador. U.S. and Asia, current political trends and opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bill Martell and Governor John Huntsman. Oh, you can take the first seat. First seat? Yeah, I'll take the second seat. Well done. Nice Thank job. You Thank, you Thank you much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and I can see by the size of the crowd that this is a pretty popular event to attend. And I would sure. note as well that uh, with temperatures in the 20s out there, this is a real statement of, of interest in politics, and, and we're honored to have all of you here. We're doubly honored to have as our guest tonight, uh, Governor Ambassador Huntsman, who, as you all know, in the last uh, presidential cycle was one of the folks running for president, of which there was a gaggle on, on the Republican side this time and gaggles on the Democratic side before. So, Governor, we're honored to have you here. It's our, it's our Thank pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So what we're going to do tonight is, uh, is talk for a bit. The plan is to ask questions to the governor on, for about a half an hour, 45 minutes, and then roughly quarter of or, or 10 of at the latest of eight, we'd like to shift this over to all of you and have you ask questions. And I think, as we'll mention again later, there's a microphone set up in the back here. Uh, Brian will help with that. And I'll reiterate again when you ask questions of the governor, uh, please give your name and affiliation and stand up at the mic to, uh, to do that. So if everyone's uh, comfortable, let's proceed. Uh, Governor, again, you're, you're seen as one of, the, one of the critical players in the Republican Party, in particular with your interest in presidential politics and having been a governor of, of Utah and as an ambassador to China, among many other accomplishments. And as you all probably know, the governor has served with four presidential administrations, going back to Reagan. So we're, it's really a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank so you, what Bill. I hope we'll have is, a, is a, an open conversation here with you. I mentioned the governor before that we really have four sets of issues we want to talk about. The first, and where we want to begin, uh, given the governor's expertise and his interests, is with this question of Asia and the growing role of Asia in the world. So, Governor, if you could begin and think, the United States has been thinking very much about all these issues going on in foreign policy, wars winding down Afghanistan and Iraq, debates about Iran with nuclear weapons uh, and North Korea, and yet there's this sense that the world is, the center of gravity in the world is shifting to Asia. Can you talk a bit about that and tell us why you think that's so important? Well, Bill, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. I see so many faces and friends I recognize, and I was, I was thinking as I walked in here about one of the most unusual moments, not to diverge too much, Bill, oh. during, during the primary, uh, when I showed up at a town hall meeting in Dover and was greeted by Isaac the Goat. <laughs> who proceeded to take a bite out of my kneecap, and, and we hobbled all the way to a third place uh, finish in, in New Hampshire. Uh, it, 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 admittedly, not enough to give us the, the afterburner effect into South Carolina, but it was, it was an incredible journey that my family and I are very, very grateful uh, to have had, uh, involving some of you in this room, and I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I think as I've, if I, as I've lived in Asia four times since the late 1970s, and just again uh, last summer living in Southeast Asia, where I took the time to visit practically every country in the region for about a, a week each, every, every country between India and Korea, everything in between, 
And, and, you know, over that sweep of time, I've watched the region transform economically and politically. I've watched the security dynamics shift. I've seen the rise of China from uh, a relatively innocuous player on the global stage to now becoming the second largest economy, one of the largest militaries, one of the largest users, if not the largest user of electricity, projecting its power for the first time on the world stage. And as you look at Asia, you have to say the United States at some point is going to have to recognize the growing dynamic that exists in Asia. It's hard for us. I look at my parents' generation, and I'm getting up there myself, by the way. Uh, and it was a very Atlantic-centric view of the world. You know, people did study abroad in Europe. They didn't go to Asia. And I look now at my kids coming up. I watch my own daughter, Gracie May, adopted from China, 14 years of age, sit on Skype on a Friday night talking to her friends in Beijing, half English, half Chinese, talking about movies and literature and boys and all of that. And I think, this is mind-blowing. Uh, my parents could no more have penetrated the divide called the Pacific Ocean. And it was hard for my generation, although I've worked my entire career trying to crack that code. Uh, and I see how seamless it is for the emerging generation to interact culturally uh, in terms of travel and communication and how that's facilitating a lot of opportunities. Challenges to be sure. And what the United States is going to have to do a better job at is recognizing that our economic interests, our security interests, and a lot of our cultural well-being, how we assimilate newcomers into our country, because that dynamic will change too in the years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, it will have a lot to do with a policy toward the Asia Pacific region that speaks to uh, closer engagement, uh, recognizing the security dynamic, taking advantage more of the economic opportunities that exist. And we haven't done that to the fullest extent possible. And in that vacuum, even though we've been a player in Asia Pacific ever since at least 1898, with, uh, after the end of the Spanish-American War, uh, we've had the rise of China, and now the second largest economy on Earth, beginning its next decade of engagement under a man named Xi Jinping, 60 years old, who now leads the fifth generation of Chinese leaders into the future. You know, 50, 60 year old for the most part, technocratic, well-schooled, exposed to the world unlike the earlier generations. So you had Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao and now Xi Jinping, the fifth generation. And uh, they're good. They understand their place in the world. They're becoming more accustomed to it far different than the earlier generations, and I've had the luxury, the privilege of having interacted with at least the last three generations. My first trip to China was with President Reagan when he took his first trip over there in the early 80s, and I was a young staffer. So that whole dynamic is causing uh, the world to take note. Uh, the Asia-Pacific region is beginning to organize itself around the rise of China. And then concomitant with that, you've got Northeast Asia that is kind of going through a transition of its own. What is absolutely fascinating and something that most Americans ought to be looking at is the neighborhood called Northeast Asia, which will soon be 20% of the world's GDP. Critical for U.S. interests because pretty soon more than half of all of our trade will transit right up the, uh, the East China Sea uh, and out across Asia. Uh, and therefore critical to our economic interests, rising militaries. And then add to that dynamic Japan, Korea, North and South Korea, Taiwan, and the northern tier of China. And look at the new leaders that have just arrived this year. And you get a sense of the historic and political dynamics that are going to keep us awake at night for the most part over issues like island disputes and sovereignty disputes that have played out for the most part since 1895 and continue to. There isn't an easy answer for them because they deal with sovereignty that nation states can't give on. But so this year we've seen the rise of Xi Jinping, the son of Xi Jinping, a former Long March veteran with Mao Zedong, former deputy prime minister put in prison during the Cultural Revolution because he was too reform-minded. And then in Japan, we're seeing the rise of Shinzo Abe, the new prime minister, uh, the grandson of a wartime minister who helped to 
had helped to oversee and manage Manchugua, Japan-occupied Manchuria. Now, you can already sense the dynamic here between families. You've got the son of, the grandson of. And then in South Korea, you have the daughter of Pak Chun-hee, who ran the country from 1961 to 1979 when he was assassinated. President Pak's mother was also assassinated by somebody loyal to North Korea. Mm -hmm. And here she is working a fairly conciliatory line toward North Korea, which is now managed by a young 29-year-old, Kim Jong-un, uh, the son of uh, another Kim, uh, the grandson of Kim Il-sung, who founded the country. Yeah. And so you've got these family dynasties in Northeast Asia, unprecedented for the most part. And between them all, they have history, they have politics, they have sovereignty disputes, and a lot of tension, and rising militaries, and alliances that are at times wobbly. Mm -hmm. And China wakes up in the morning and they say, we're a nation state surrounded by 15 countries. You in the United States, you have it easy. You have these impenetrable buffers called the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And you're probably not gonna go to war with Canada anytime soon. <laughs> Kind of like being governor of Utah. I never once had to declare war on Idaho. It was, uh, <laughs> Did you ever come, it was you ever a come pretty close safe and predictable relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, not so in China, where you've got nation states on your periphery, some of whom you've gone to war with, in the case of the Soviet Union, in the case of India, 1962, Vietnam, 1979. And some are on the verge of collapse. You have what I think will likely be the most significant flashpoint of the next decade or two in the world, and that is South Asia. When the U.S. is out of Afghanistan, another vacuum will be created, and you'll see filling that vacuum all the predictable players, all nuclear armed for the most part, and for the first time, China's gonna have to wake up and say, the Americans aren't there protecting the region, keeping it safe. We may have to play a role for the first time ever. So all of this, and then you look south to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the 10 nation states between Myanmar and Indonesia up to the Philippines, 600 million people, multiple different religions, languages, and cultures that are about as cohesive as I've ever seen them in recent years. It was an association brought about by the Vietnam War in 1967 as a collective security organization, originally six, now 10, and they're coming together economically. They're trading with one another. They're worried about the rise of China. They're worried about the subcontinent. And they're kind of firing on all, on all cylinders. So you look at the region on a whole, and you've got the rise in the center of China of concern to everybody, the tensions based on history and sovereignty with Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, which is really a crossroads of East Asia and South Asia that is really coming into their own. And we now, as a country, have to make sense of that. And we have to say, our long-term interests are not gonna be the Middle East. We have Iran to deal with, no doubt. And we have the peace process that we need to stay engaged with. But our longer-term interests are gonna be the Asia-Pacific region, economically and militarily. And we better get with that picture and we better engage with policies that are going to make us respected players in the region. Good. I think I have the first headline for the night. Governor Huntsman never anticipated attacking I uh, Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Nevada. <laughs> I, I came very close to Nevada. But... <laughs> um, Never Idaho. Right, if you think about the last uh, 48 hours in, in the President of the United States, President Obama announced the deal with Iran, the, the first of a, of a potential series of deals. And on, on its nuclear weapons program, and you know how central that's been to American thinking and American security on the one hand. President Truman has once quoted him saying he wished he had what are called one-handed economists because economists say on the one hand and the other hand. <laughs> on the other hand, uh, we look, the debate in the United States in the last couple of years has been of this pivot to Asia. And the, what I want, I'd like you to reflect on this, Governor, as you think about what does that say to part, uh, states in Europe and the Middle East and Southwest Asia and what are the implications as we think about this shift? We think about, as you mentioned, the center of gravity economically is increasingly Asia. We have growing pressure from China on military forces. We have a number of, of geostrategic pressures going on. How does this pivot, what, how does that relate to our other classic interests in Europe and, and Middle East? Uh, and yet, how do we balance this in a way that, uh, that builds a better relationship with the future in Asia, but doesn't abandon our classic relationships in, uh, every, in all the areas to the, uh, to the West? Well, we've got to walk and chew gum at the same time. 
<laughs> you know, presumably we can do that as a country. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a couple of sons at the U.S. Naval Academy who are preparing for their future, and they're learning about the whole world, uh, although they're studying Chinese as a language, uh, which is probably most central to where their focus is going to be. But if we can't watch out for our interests in the Middle East, and listen, the dynamic there is going to change considerably in the years to come, A, because our footprint will lessen, as it should, based upon the post-Iraq and post-Afghanistan period. Number two, because we're going to become a whole lot more energy self-sufficient. Never independent, but energy self-sufficient. I don't think we've even stopped to think through the national security to say nothing of the economic implications of energy self-sufficiency. That's where we're going. And we don't have much of an energy policy to enshrine what that means going forward. But that's going to be a huge uh, policy uh, 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 impact on, on the Middle East. You know, the better part of $300 billion that we would see go offshore in the name of uh, uh, oil imports will change. And with that, our relationship with Saudi Arabia, our relationship with members of OPEC will change. Uh, and now with the negotiations with Iran, that's going to add another layer of complexity that will without question impact the peace process. I don't see how it won't. And it's going to put stresses and strains on some of our traditional alliances in a region like Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Israel, the and Israel, of course. No question about it. Yeah. And, and so the region 10 years from now the Middle East is going to look a whole lot different. And we're going to have to be part of how that is reconstructed. And we're going to have to do it in a way that speaks to the one indispensable policy initiative that I think we've really missed out on in recent years in the rush toward a military mindset in the region. Mm -hmm. And that is, what about seeding the pockets of despair with opportunity? So why do we have problems in the Middle East right now? And why have they become so acute in recent years, whether North Africa or the Middle East or the subcontinent? And I'd have to say that where there are pockets of despair, people will turn to radicalism in some cases. And there aren't enough jobs, there aren't enough opportunities, and we ought to be more of a player in that regard. When was the last time we used our toolbox of international economic policies or initiatives to help rebuild the region? Well, I'm a retired trade ambassador, and I worked with some in the region, but clearly there haven't been enough. Clearly there have not been enough. And we're going to have to, I think, be over the next 10 years fully engaged on the security side with Iran. That's unavoidable, how Syria begins to play out. Uh, and just as aggressively on the economic rehabilitation side, because those pockets of despair are going to have to be seeded with pockets of opportunity somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. And we have to be a player in that. When you, when you look at, at China, and I, I think the, everybody, I think the, the, the foreign policy intelligentsia, the society as a whole, concludes China is just a growing economic power. There's no question about that, and military power as well. And as you pointed out, by the way, you all should know that uh, Governor uh, Huntsman is fluent in Mandarin. Uh, you might pick that up in some of the, some of the pronunciations, which were quite good. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I can't use it at home anymore to <laughs> argue with family members, because I have two daughters who now speak it pretty well. <laughs> It's a They're leveling. on to me. It's a leveling function. Yeah. Don't worry. It's good. Uh, so China remains the most important state. What's in Asia? What's your analysis of, the, of uh, President Xi Jinping? Um, do you think of him as a? How, how does he, how does his vision for China relate to us? Is he a reformer? Is he classic hardline conservative? Where look at his administration and, and give us your the benefit of your judgment as to where you how you think his policies will relate to the, the future of China and our relationships to it. He has, he's a pragmatist who has the benefit of a standing committee of the Politburo, numbering seven people total, who are all of his faction of the Communist Party of China, which I haven't seen in recent years. So if you go back to the last 10 years under Hu Jintao, the standing committee of the Politburo, which is kind of like the board of directors of the country, it's yeah. the senior most decision-making body, was nine members, not seven, so it's been slimmed down as of the 18th Party Congress last November. And all but one are a member of his faction of the party. Uh, only Li Keqiang is the non-faction member, mm -hmm. which suggests to me that if he is successful in the consolidation of power, he's been in office for one year, 
And if you look at China traditionally, it's about a year and a half to two years before a head of state is able to fully consolidate their power with the military, the People's Liberation Army, with the party. What is the party? The party is 80 million members strong in a country of 1.3 billion people, spread out in about 3,700 outposts around the country. If it isn't strictly ideological in nature, which it isn't, it still remains the key organizing element in Chinese society. And then you have to organize among the so-called princeling population, the sons and daughters and the grandsons and granddaughters of the revolutionary elite. Xi Jinping comes from the princeling side. He has some military credentials that Hu Jintao, uh, who preceded him, did not and failed miserably in connecting with the People's Liberation Army. Uh, Xi Jinping worked as an assistant to former Defense Minister Gung Biao from 1979 to 1981. So he lived through the Vietnam War that China had with Vietnam, lasted just a couple of months. They got their fannies kicked for the most part. Mm -hmm. So why is it that he will likely not choose to go to war with Japan over islands? All kinds of reasons, led first and foremost by economic survival. But he also carries with him that experience of having worked with the Central Military Commission under Minister Gung Biao and seen the failed foray uh, with, with Vietnam. So he's rising at a time of great challenge economically, social expectations among a country with 700 million internet users and 100 million bloggers, an economy that is sure to taper back. And a real challenge for him will be, how do you create jobs in a country that's going from 800 million farmers to 200 million farmers? You have 600 million redundant farmers looking for stuff to do. <laughs> and they're now moving into the city centers, Tianjin, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Chengdu, Chongqing. And these cities are going from 20 million to 40 million. And so what did they talk about? Last week at the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress, they talked about urbanization. How do you take a city of 20 million people and make it livable at 40 million people and still have air that is breathable and roads that you can travel on, health care, which they haven't delivered on for the rural population? So he's got all of this to do, and I wouldn't in a million years trade the challenges we have for the challenges they have. We sometimes look at China and say it's a straight shot to success. They're rising and there's nothing that's going to stop it. Well, guess again. There are some significant problems on the horizon for them. Well, Governor, one of the reasons I asked the, the question I did is the debate here in the States has been China has a free market economy, a dynamic, uh, highly dynamic free market economy, and authoritarian political system. And the question is, maybe this is an American question, but the question is the two can't forever coexist. Something has to blow. And that's why I wonder, is, under the current leadership of China, should we be optimistic in some longer term sense that we may see China go through some great transformation? Or? They, they, they will never look like a Jeffersonian <laughs> democracy. <laughs> and, and we're fooling ourselves if we think that's going to be the ultimate outcome. They will move more toward uh, a pluralistic system, inevitably. They will move toward the expansion of civil society, which I think will be one of the most exciting short-term endeavors on the part of China. And you may even see greater competition among the selection of the party elite. Standing Committee, Politburo, Central Committee, National People's Congress, which is 3,000 members strong, and then the five tiers in society going from the, from the, the center to the local where these decisions are made. I think you'll see a little more competition there. I mean, Vietnam is even experimenting with some of that. Uh, but what I expect Xi Jinping to do, having watched his career for quite some time, he's a former governor of Fujian and Zhejiang, two very prosperous provinces. If you were, in fact, to break them out population-wise and economically, they're bigger than most nation states in the world. And he's run both of those quite successfully. I would say he will move as fast as he needs to move to stay uh, ahead of the, the mob. And the expectations today in China are sky high. That's what he has against him right off the bat. He's never going to be able to please everybody. He's never going to be able to deliver on what the bloggers and those on, on Weibo and other modes of networking are, are suggesting he do. But he's going to have to stay one step ahead of trouble. And my sense is that he's got the instincts and the politi political organizing skills to be able to do that. We'll know.
in the next year as he consolidates his power f further. How do you how do you think the 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 uh, leaders in Asia look at the U.S. in terms of our leadership? Do they do they see us as as deep sense of commitment? Do they see us as distracted? How do you, what's your your take your judgment on? how they're looking at us right now. Well, they, they see us as underutilizing our capabilities, which mm -hmm. have always been enormous in the region. That's a great point. Uh, yeah. We're underutilizing our capabilities, and they don't understand why. Where's the United States? When we used to see them, they're not here. Why aren't they cooperating more with us in terms of military-to-military -military engagement? What about trade initiatives that used to happen pretty regularly? We haven't seen anything like that in recent years. And then when we had the government shutdown recently, I mean, our own president of the United States couldn't even show up to the most important annual gathering of Asian leaders that we have every year. Now, we just write that off and say, oh, the president doesn't have time. You know, he doesn't need to go to that. Well, guess again, the relationships in Asia are built on FaceTime, showing up and yeah. developing relationships. And guess who fills the void when we aren't there with the 22 others in the Asia-Pacific region? China's there. Yeah. And China shows up with Hu Jintao or, or Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, and they say, see the empty chair over there? Well, the United States is not the loyal ally, Japan, Korea, Philippines, that they used to be. They're not even showing up anymore. And people then start to wonder. Yeah. That has uh, a deleterious impact on our ability to move the market in Asia. So we have some catching up to do, and it won't be easy. Many see Russia and China as growing competitors of the United States, and there's a lot of evidence that Russia and China much more closely collaborate on military issues, political issues, uh, energy kinds of issues. Um, do you see, how, what's your take on that? Do you, do you think that's a, 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 something we need to worry about? And can we use this relationship between Russia and China to our, uh, to our advantage? Back in the 70s, Nixon administration developed what was called triangular diplomacy. That yeah. is Beijing, Washington, Washington Moscow, yeah. that balancing. How do you, Governor, how do you... How do you think that through? So what brought the United States and China together in, in February of 1972 under an agreement called the Shanghai Communique was one thing, the Soviet Union. Yeah. And that was we both came, even though we were fighting China in Vietnam at the time, no trade, no student exchanges. We'd fought them years earlier on the Korean Peninsula. They lost 400,000 men, including Chairman Mao's son, who's buried there. And we lost a lot, too. Yet into that mail you went our member national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, and then followed up by Nixon. And we developed a relationship based on a big, bold balance of power strategy. We don't do strategy much anymore. But it was driven by the Soviet Union. Now, the, now Russia and China come together uh, to try to thwart our interests from time to time. Uh, and China is using. Russia selectively. If Russia didn't have that thousand plus mile border with China, and if it weren't a mere energy play for China, they would be irrelevant uh, with Russia losing population and some standing in the world. But they're important from an energy standpoint to China, and they're important from a strategic location standpoint. And you have to remember there is great historic hostility between Russia and China. I think the best depiction of that is the Great Hall of the People. So if you go to Tiananmen Square in downtown Beijing, and you look at the one building, the Renmin Da Hui Tang, the Great Hall of the People, which is where all the big meetings take place. So when you go and visit the Chinese uh, senior official, you'll meet in a room about this big, and you'll be in two chairs like this, and beautiful murals on the wall, and each of the rooms depict a different province of the country, and just beautifully done. Well, that was built thanks to the Soviet Union, to celebrate the 10-year friendship between China and the Soviet Union. Started in 1959, right? So that, was, that marked the 10-year relationship from 49 to 59. And so hostile was their relationship by the early 60s that the whole building was built Stalin-esque style, mm -hmm. and the Russians left the roof undone and said, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. Uh, and that was when the Great Leap Forward was in its early stages. And the disagreements between uh, Khrushchev and, and Mao Zedong over ideology 
And so it's a Stalin-esque building, the Great All the People with the Chinese roof. And <laughs> most people don't pick up on this when they visit, but it's, it, to me, it, when I used to drive by, it would always represent the fickle nature of the, the Russian-Chinese relationship, which is still very much the same today. You know, they use each other where they need to. And right now it's against the United States. I'd like to turn to the second part, which is America's role in the world. My, my first question is that, you know, you think about the United States, we've been in economic downturn for five years. We have wars that have been going on for more than 10 years. We have a country that's probably a little bit tired of carrying the burdens of global responsibility. And thus we've had the debate of the United States either in decline or withdrawal or disengagement from the world. Where are you in that, in that debate? On, uh, is America in decline or are we retrenching? Where, uh, can you think out loud about that? We're confused. I think we're terribly confused about our, our role in the world. It seems that, you know, with the rise of the Internet and our ability to gather information instantaneously and to be more globally minded, we've almost become more insular over time. You know, I look at Congress, for example. I don't know that I've ever seen a more insular Congress in terms of the lack of interest in the rest of the world. Now, granted, we've got problems here at home, and the best foreign policy we could pursue would be rebuilding our efforts here and showing the rest of the world that we are resilient enough to get back on our feet. So we have to have a discussion about what America's role in the world is going to be. I, you know, the millennials are coming up. I'm raising a few of them myself. They're <laughs> eager. They're enthusiastic. They're smart. They don't want to be handed a world that is, that is in a hole. They don't want their country to be, to be sidelined and made irrelevant. We've always played a role based on our values in the world. And I say, when we live our values, we project an image to the world that is indispensable. When we don't live our values, a little bit like today, we become at times a laughing stock, and we're not taken seriously. So I think the best remedy for where we are in the world is we need to start living and practicing our own values. We can't, so as a diplomat in the old mm -hmm. days, you, you meet with foreign ministers, and you meet with heads of state, and you talk about what we think they should be doing. You need an open market. You need greater transparency. You need this, you need that. In the old days, it would move the market somewhat. Today, they look at us like, how can you say that when your country is in such fumble formation? When you're not living the values that you're preaching to the rest of us. Then I say, we need to call a timeout. We need to get our own house in order. We need to start practicing what we preach, and we will send a lesson to the rest of the world without even saying a word. And that is America is the resilient nature that everyone thought it to be. We can, we can hit the turf, we can get back up, we can dust ourselves off. And as Alexis de Tocqueville used to say, you know, America's a great country, you know, not because the people are so great, but because we have the ability to repair our faults. And I don't know of a lot of countries out there that can do that. We can, and we're in a moment where we can actually prove to the world we can get in the game again. Prime Minister Churchill had a, a, a partial rejoinder to that. He said, uh, he said Amer Americans eventually do the right thing because they exhaust all other possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> you feel that, don't you? You do feel yeah. that. You do. What, you're, what, day. what you're describing, Governor, is something we in the States call grand strategy. And yeah. the pre uh, President Truman in 1947 said, the function of American grand strategy is to contain the Soviet Union. And the debate for the last 20 years has been this sense of drift in American foreign policy. We don't yeah. quite know what we're about. Right. If you were to recast that, if, you, if, if earlier aspirations had, had panned out and you were in charge of American foreign Heaven policy. Heaven forbid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the famous William F. Buckley quote. They said, he ran for governor in the 60s. He said, what are you, you going to do if you win? He said, demand a recount. <laughs> <laughs> that was mayor of New York City. Yeah, so yeah, yeah mayor of New York City. Uh, well, how, what, what principles would you articulate? Well, we have to, we have to look back and, and see why we're where we are today. And at the end of the Cold War in, in 89, I think it's impacted my party, the Republican Party, as much as anything else. We had a unifying coalescing force called anti-communism yeah. that yeah. brought everybody together around a unifying theme. We don't have that anymore. And we're trying to find a new unifying theme, and it's really difficult to do. And, and then we were hit on 9-11, and I think we're still in many ways recovering from a body blow that we never thought we'd, we'd, we'd take. 
And we missed opportunities after the end of the Cold War. I think we squandered our leadership being the only power on the world stage that could really act with any, with any meaningful intent to then 9-11. And then we had the economic collapse, which left every American reeling. And we're just kind of getting over that. So we've taken some real body blows as a country. And you stop to kind of think about it. We've been traumatized a little bit over the last 12 years. We're getting back on our feet. We have an opportunity now, uh, I think, to engage in a new form of globalization. That isn't to be feared. So one of my concerns about this country is we fear the world sometimes. We fear engagement. Uh, where we ought to embrace it with optimism and a spirit of opportunity. And I think we are on the cusp of a new form of globalization that will be very good for this country in terms of rebuilding our economic fundamentals. And I say that because we've been given one of the greatest gifts an economy can receive, which is a new form of fuel to fire up its engines and to move forward. I don't think we realize what this will mean to our economic prospects going forward, to job creation and rebuilding our manufacturing base. So I'm on the f board of Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. which makes great cars, yeah. for those of you in the market. <laughs> and, and, and where are we focusing investments uh, is much here, R building out manufacturing lines, exporting you know, soon the Mustang to China and Lincolns to China. Uh, I'm also on the board of a company called Caterpillar, which makes big yellow tractors. <laughs> and I never thought that I would live long enough to see a, a plant close down in Asia, in Japan, and move to the United States, which happened not so long ago. Right. Huntsman Corporation, a company I know well, <laughs> we are paying the equivalent of 15 to $20 per barrel of oil economics for raw material inputs. China's paying 100 bucks a barrel. The UK is paying 95 bucks a barrel, all because of natural gas. Yeah. And we can now manufacture raw material in Louisiana, export it to China cheaper than it can be manufactured in China. And I say there's something happening here that people aren't grasping that could be part of our recovery getting back on our feet if we take it seriously. And if we begin, begin to rebuild and retool for the coming decades, we can hit it out of the park. I have no doubt about that. And that will give us the confidence. It's hard as a nation to have total confidence when your unemployment is 8, 9, 10%. Yeah. And among kids just getting out of college, 15, 20%. We shouldn't say that in this audience here. That's a well, it's getting better. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's where we are. I mean, it's a tough, tough go. And then for those getting jobs out of college, you know, your real income is probably 8 to 10% less than 2007, just before the collapse. And we wonder why people are having a hard time paying the bills. Mm -hmm. They're doing all the right things. They're going to school. They're getting jobs, and they're not doing as well. So this to our economic prospects could be extremely important. But it's going to mean that we have to engage with the rest of the world in a confident, uh, uh, level-headed fashion. There's been a, uh, it's, it's been underreported, but the last several months, the United States has, dis has displaced both, uh, ch uh, both uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia as the number one global energy producer. And you suspect this is beginning to seep into American thinking now because yep. the Chinese are worried that, that, in fact, we are growing again in a very interesting way with respect to energy. Is this no, no, no question about it. They're hobbled by things like air quality. I can't even begin to describe the problem of air quality when you live there. We don't even think about it when we reflect on China. But the big cities are polluted. They're losing brain power and talent people who don't want to live in polluted cities. It's a huge problem. And you just can't turn off the economy. You just can't build another ring road on top of seven or eight others outside of Beijing or Shanghai. You can't just push you know, the coal-fired stoves at every little hutong home house. You just can't turn them off. Yeah. They have a big challenge ahead of them on things just as simple as air quality. Governor, uh, one of the debates here in the states in the last couple of years, and the President, uh, President Obama actually engaged in this in the last couple of months, uh, and President Putin had a rejoinder in the New York Times, the whole question of American exceptionalism. Uh, and the argument is that we're an exceptional country, it influences everything we do, and, and where is your take? Do you view us as exceptional? Or uh, President Obama initially said that we're exceptional, but everybody else thinks they're exceptional. How do you, how do you, how do you sort out that debate? I think we get caught up in words. Uh, I think we're an extraordinary nation. And I think the world, by and large, sees us as an extraordinary nation. And having lived abroad, what is it that 
foreign leaders envy about the United States. One, they envy our ability to merge diversity into one nation state. We take it for granted. You know, in my own family, I've got a Chinese daughter, I have an Indian daughter, and, and I married a southerner, which is kind of off the map a little bit. <laughs> As the expression goes, governor, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. well, Mary Kay's over here, she can fend for herself. And, and, and I say, I don't even think twice about it, but I look at my own family. Hmm. We, we merge diversity. I remember you talking to Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore when I served there as a diplomat 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. He would say, the world would like to do what you do and you just take it for granted. You merge diversity into a melting pot and you make it work. And you bring out of that energy and innovation under rule of law and a constitution and you move forward. That's a huge deal. And the rest of the world, I think, respects that enormously. Number two, the rest of the world respects our innovative approach to problem solving, our research universities, mm -hmm. our ability to invent new things. That just doesn't happen. So what does China want to do? China would like to crack the code on innovation. Yeah. So they're looking at Silicon Valley, they're looking at Austin, Texas, they're looking at Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, they're looking around to say, how does it all happen? You know, the four or five features that come together around innovation in America that nobody can seem to replicate, the world is fascinated by that. They sometimes think we're heavy-handed in terms of our approach. And that exceptionalism is probably at once our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. We're proud of who we are. We like to get up on a soapbox and talk about it. Not everybody likes to listen. And I think that's the part that we need to temper to reality and let our deeds and our actions speak for themselves. When we're living our values, the rest of the world will see it. And they'll say right on. I've, I've always been persuaded that, that we really don't know why we're innovative, but the rest of the world thinks we know and we keep it a secret. <laughs> it's a, we have no idea. It's, it's called, you know, it's creative destruction or collective yes. chaos, whatever they want to call it. But I used to tell my friends in China about Silicon Valley, you know, we accept failure. You, f you fail once in Silicon Valley, that's a badge of honor. You're just getting, you're just beginning your journey. You fail in China, you're done. You know, it's hard to become an innovative nation where the entrepreneurial class can't exist because you can't fail. You gotta, right. you gotta, for face reasons, if nothing else, you've gotta succeed. As a, as a way to, I'd ask Ann Cayman, whom you all know, to, to warn me at, at, at around this, about this time to switch to Q&A. So I have a couple more questions and we'll get to the, to the audience. Uh, last part is about, about you, and, uh, and it's all about you, but it's... it's uh, well, that's the least important yeah. part of all. <laughs> uh, you were a candidate for, uh, for the Republican nomination for president in the 2012 cycle. Do we and, have to talk about that? Yeah, just, it's, it's a, it, these are good questions. Um, what was the most poignant memory or experience or lesson that you derived from, from that time going out across the country? Well, it, it, it dawns on you as a candidate pretty quickly that you have a choice. You can either be you, even if you lose, <laughs> yeah. or you cannot be you and lose or maybe win. Yeah, hard to know. But it, it really is a revealing thing, just introspectively, because you learn a lot about who you are and what you believe in and what you're willing to stand on a soapbox and tout night after night after night in the grueling New Hampshire primary, particularly, where the good folks in these town halls that all go back like 200 years and people fill in. And when you start the journey, there may be 10 people who show up. And by the time you end, there may be 200 or 500 who show up. And in all cases, they take their obligation seriously as citizens in this state. And because of that, I think this process is very important and healthy and could be even more so going forward. We can talk about that later. But I think the, the way in which you develop and mature as a candidate because it forces you like no other activity in any other human endeavor to look inward at why you're doing this and why you love your country and why you think you might have something to add and therefore why you put everything that you've ever done on the line to be chopped up and criticized and <coughs> dissected. Now let the record show I'm not asking you if you're gonna run again. What I'm asking though is, do you ever think of it? Do you ever noodle about this, this idea of running for president again? Does it? Is it, is it part of your thinking or is it just? Well, you know, you probably have to be a little crazy to run the first time. 
<laughs> I mean, normal people just don't wake up in the morning probably and say, I think I'll run for president. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it evolves. So, you know, you're governor of a state, you know, you serve overseas and you say, you know, if I'm not willing to step into the arena, what does it say about me as a public servant? And I've got ideas that I've tried out in a state that probably are applicable on the national stage and, and you go for it. And, you know, so you, you do think about that and you do think about you know, if only you could find your place in the marketplace of candidates or ideas to try that one thing on tax reform or on education reform or whatever it might be and the legacy that you, you might be able to leave. Mm -hmm. I was less good as a politician because I hate people with big egos. Mm -hmm. And in the game of politics, you meet a whole lot of people with big egos. And the two things that are totally underutilized by most politicians are these things hanging on their heads. <laughs> they don't stop and listen. And they don't stop and process what citizens tell them. And I found more strength and comfort and great ideas as a governor, you know, sitting on a sidewalk on State Street in Salt Lake City, Utah at a taco cart. I go there probably once or twice a week. And just random people would walk up on the street, some without a home, some who didn't have a job, some people who are, you know, bankers and stuff. And I'll say, Governor, you know, I like this about you, or I don't like this about you, or why don't you try this on for size? And you listen a lot as governor. And because of that, unlike in the legislature where you talk a lot, and I think that's why there's a great cultural divide, in a sense, in this country between governors who have to do stuff, yes. listen to the people, and take action, or you just don't survive. And a legislature that, for four years now, we haven't had a budget. We just go continuing resolution to continue to cliffhanger to cliffhanger to continuing resolution. The largest economy in the world. I mean, it's just inconceivable that we do that. Which, you know, which is a long way of saying that I love public service. I'll always be committed to public service. And as an itinerant public ser servant from time to time, it's hard to know where you're going to wind up. But I'm not here as a candidate tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I, I can't think of a better way to turn to the Q&A for the audience. Absolutely terrific. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, the microphone is back here and back here. And again, please, uh, your name and affiliation, and uh, we'll, we have plenty of time for some. And who you voted for, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I can decide if I want to answer or not. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Governor. Oh, hi, George. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, welcome to New Hampshire, and I'd sort of like to pick up on your last point and ask you what you think is going on with the Republican Party these days, and as a card-carrying member of that party yourself, why do you think your ideas got so little traction within your party? Well, for all, a lot of reasons, and, uh, and thank you for the question. Every election cycle brings with it a different rhythm and flow, a different set of priorities, a different hierarchy of, of issues that people want to talk about. And I think as a result of high unemployment and bailouts and an economy that was just failing for the most part, there was understandably a lot of anger in that last election cycle. Bring down the president, bring down this, talk anti-Washington. Well, I'm not an angry person. And I'm not an anti-person. I'm a for-person. And as governor, you work on ideas. You bring people together, you squeeze out a consensus, and you move the machinery forward. That's what I like to do. And so we talked about a lot of ideas, foreign policy, economics, health care. Nobody really wanted to talk about ideas in the primary. They want to talk about drama. They want to talk about the circus called presidential politics. So you could spend a, an hour talking about how you want to reshape the world, a strategy for the United States. And you might say something about one of the other guys running on the way out to the press corps. And the next day, the headline will be Huntsman Slams Gingrich. You know, it's like, well, didn't you hear the one hour I spent on America's role in the world? Apparently not. So we never got beyond the circus-like atmosphere of the early primary, which clearly I'm not an expert at being part of that effort. I'm not a negative person, and I have a hard time ripping other people down. I just, I don't do that. I didn't do it in the campaigns I ran for governor. I ran on ideas. And either people like that or they don't. Only to find that when you break through the primary period, you got to talk about ideas. That's what the American people want. So we're somehow going to have to synchronize 
the Republican primary efforts with the interests of the broader population, we haven't been able to do that yet. And that's going to take some real, some real finessing. Uh, I think the party has a proud history. And, you know, I, so I, I serve uh, as a trustee of the Reagan Library and the Reagan Foundation Board. And I was out in LA last week for our annual gathering. And I was reminded around our small table of people who serve on that board. You, know, you got, you know, George Schultz at the senior end, and you know, I'm probably the youngest in the group. Uh, Reagan always, say what you will about his politics, he always worked to expand the tent. Always. Always bringing people in, looking for new demographics to bring in. And for whatever reason, we've gone in reverse in recent years. We've lost key demographics that are critical to electoral success. People want to know that they're voting for something, not against something. And we have to have a message that is visionary, that is optimistic, that is inclusive, and that is courageous. And if we can blend all of those together, like Lincoln used to do, like Teddy Roosevelt used to do, like Eisenhower did, like Reagan did in ending the Cold War, we'll do just fine. But we're not there. And that's going to take people to be able to pull that off. And my concern is we don't have forever the way that things are moving as quickly as they are today. If you lose in 2016, chances are you're out until 2024. And I don't know how a party that is positioned to be the governing alternative can stay relevant if you've lost seven of the last eight elections. How do you stay in people's mind as a govern relevant governing alternative over all those years before the marketplace begins to throw up alternatives? So I believe in the traditions of the Republican Party as expressed and exemplified by the people I just mentioned. And I think that can be recouped but it's going to take some doing, first and foremost, by building bridges to the lost demographics. Because in the end, you know, it's about basic math. If you can't pull the numbers together, I don't care who you are, where you're campaigning, you're just not going to win. Those demographics have got to be rebuilt, and that won't be easy. Good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, and name and affiliation, please. Yes, my name is Pat Rupel. Hello, John. Hello, Welcome Pat. back. How are you? My husband, John, and I worked on your primary campaign. Thank you for it. And I'm sorry we didn't make it as far as we Well, you to. know, <laughs> I was talking to my son before I left tonight. He's retired military, Navy, in Norfolk, same age as you. And I said, Scott, he's young enough that he can go the full campaign this time. And I do not believe that you're not going to run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the now, question what, is... <laughs> what I want to ask you, I don't want to get too long-winded, uh, how did the 2012 campaign change you? Well, it makes you, um, on one hand, a deeper believer in this thing called democracy mm -hmm. and how it functions. And at the, on the other hand, the two-handed economist, <laughs> uh, much more acutely connected to the structural issues that stand in the way of our maximizing our democracy. You wouldn't know about it otherwise. So why is it that I feel that our, the way we finance campaigns has to be changed? Oh, I agree. But I've done it. I've been out there, and I say it's a total embarrassment, and we just can't keep going like this. Yet it's really hard for mainstream candidates to take it on because you're not going to survive very long. So you become acutely aware of these things called structural impediments that stand in the way of this great country maximizing its democracy. I wouldn't have known it any other way. So on one hand, a great love for the most freewheeling democracy on the face of the earth, exemplified by this, and at the same time, deeply concerned by the structural barriers that are eroding this great democracy. I will be in Concord when you sign up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Doubt you'll see that, but we got the support of the Concord Monitor, by the way, last go around. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Governor, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Paul Brock. I have no particular affiliation other than with some friends and family in the front row. Thanks, Paul. Um, one of the more significant things you said tonight, at least to me, was we don't do good strategy anymore as a country. 
And, and given we operate in an environment where our government bounces from fiscal crisis to fiscal crisis, or uh, at best from a biennial election to another biennial election, how do we as a country, to get back to the, to the, to the Asia theme this evening, how do we as a country build strategic relations with people for whom long-term planning and strategic planning is simply part of their ethos. It's what they do. Right. Long-term planning to them is, is, a, is a 10 or 50 year plan. Given that dichotomy, is there any hope for us? <laughs> well, we, it's a wing and a prayer sometimes, but that's worked for us for a lot of years. And I, I know that the leadership in China, along with other countries, they sit in their private meetings, they look at this nation, and they scratch their heads and they say, how does it all work? <laughs> how does it work under their form of government? They, there's no long-term plan. They have elections that seem to be you know, complete, uh, unpredicted chaos from time to time, economies that go up and down. But it works. It's a free society that just functions the way it does. And we're all part of that free society. I would love to see this country embrace a concept around a strategy of sorts. So I've lived in four countries before. This is the only one I've lived in that doesn't have a strategy. Now, what do I mean by that? So as governor of a state, you know, we try to develop a strategy. So you've got to have education right, or you're going to fail the next generation. You've got to have certain thresholds of success. You just have to do it to measure up in terms of 21st century competitiveness. You have to have infrastructure that, you know, even as a Republican, I had to build roads and a lot of other things. You can't get products and people around otherwise when you're in a rapidly growing state. You gotta have an energy policy. Republicans or Democrats, both sides, they would agree with that because if we don't take advantage of where we are, we're missing out on a huge economic opportunity. And you have to have a strategy globally that enshrines our engagement with the rest of the world around fairly consistent themes or we'll lose that ability to move the marketplace so as part of No Labels, which is a group that I co-chair, we're endeavoring, and I'm deeply into this, putting together a book with some really interesting thinkers at some of our leading institutions in this country that would say, if this country were to develop a strategy, Republican or Democrat, what are the elements that would have to be part of it that we as Americans just have to get right? Or you wake up in 50 years and say, why didn't we think of this? You know, what, educationally or in terms of energy or in terms of engagement with some of the troublemakers of the world, we at least have to think through Republicans or Democrats what it is we need to do as a minimum as a nation state to really succeed in the 21st century, which I think will be marked by highly competitive nations that are trying to do everything we're trying to do only faster. Uh, and uh, our head start, which would have been uh, counted by years some time ago would now be counted by months in terms of our technology advantage. Uh, we still innovate well. We have great institutions of higher learning. We have rule of law. We have stability and predictability. All good. But we need to give some thought to what that strategy is going forward and what it is we need at a minimum to get right in order for all Americans to have access to an opportunity ladder, if nothing else fair rules of the game, an opportunity ladder where regardless of your point of origin or the socioeconomics of your neighborhood, you're given a shot. That's all part of some strategy. And right now, we don't have time, you're quite right, we don't have time to think that way. It was very telling in negotiating with China, as I did in different capacities. On the Chinese side of the table, you'd have arguably the best long-term strategic thinkers in the world. And on the American side of the table, arguably the best short-term tactical thinkers in the world. <laughs> and you have this divide that is, uh, that is impenetrable between both sides. And we're talking different languages, literally and figuratively, about how we, how we see the world. On the Chinese side, they say, tell us where you're going to be in 20, 30 years in terms of your force deployments in the Asia-Pacific region. And we say, we want the soybean market open next week. And, and there'd be a huge disconnect of sorts. But, there's a cultural differences. There's a famous story at the end of the Second World War. We uh, interviewed a bunch of uh, generals on the German general staff, and they said, you know, how did the war turn out the way it did? 
And one of the uh, German generals said, he said, it's easy. He said, uh, war is chaos, and Americans are great at chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tom Branscombe. I'd like to pivot away from politics and back to your experience in China. A couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation right here about the global financial crisis that happened a few years ago and kind of its remnants and what its causes were. And it was a very American and Eurocentric kind of discussion and largely based on debt. And we seem to have kind of a, almost a nonchalance about that debt continuing to grow here. And I'm wondering about the perspective of this from China. Do they, A, do they do debt? Uh, do you ever see a time when China would choose not to buy our debt, which might cause a problem here? Or do you see a time when the dollar would stop being the currency of the realm in the world and the Chinese currency might be, replace it? It's a great set of questions. And I'll just say very quickly that the dollar will remain the reserve currency of the world for as long as I can see into the future. But the renminbi ain't there, and it won't be there anytime soon. It could, over the next 10 years, become a regionally relevant uh, East Asia currency. So when I took Indonesia rupees uh, from Jakarta to Beijing recently, you know, in the old days, in Jakarta, they wouldn't take the renminbi. They said, we don't take China's currency. Now, yeah, I took the rupee back to the Bank of China. Juan Buleao, they said. Nega, nega be Juan Buleao. You know, we don't take that currency. So the dynamics are already shifting in terms of the recognized currencies in, in Asia. What has really emerged in recent months, uh, and one of the topics of the third plenum, just a couple of weeks ago, which is the most important meeting they have, by the way, in China at the end of every party congress, which they have every five years and have since the death of Mao in 76, that's when they put all their long-term policies together. Uh, and they're very concerned about the emerging debt I at the local levels of government in China. Nobody knows quite how large it is, but I can tell you it is substantial. And local governments have been borrowing short-term instruments to pay long-term debt at outrageous uh, 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 interest rates. Uh, and there's no bond market. Uh, there's no ability other than through, you know, subsidies basically to fund a lot of their projects. And nobody quite knows the level of debt. Uh, and so they're working on ways to account for the debt and deal with it, all the while looking at Japan, seeing where they have been over the last 25 years with non-performing loans, a currency that was battered, and structural inefficiencies throughout their economy, which used to be the second largest in the world, now the third, and a country of 120 million people, soon to be 90 million people, because they don't accept immigrants as, as readily as other countries do. Uh, and so they're looking at the lessons of Japan. We should have been looking at Japan a little more over recent years uh, to see where some of those anti-growth policies will get you. Uh, but I think one of the unwritten stories about China really is the level of debt that has been incurred at the local levels. So the largest stimulus package in the history of the world was released in 2009, equaling about 4 trillion yuan, roughly equivalent to $650 billion. So that is a percentage of China's GDP, which is probably $7 trillion per year, as opposed to our $16 trillion, would be the largest stimulus package. Yet a lot of roads to nowhere were built. Nobody quite can account for where all of it went. So there are some big challenges there. In terms of their buying our debt and treasury instruments, of which they hold about 1.3 trillion, maybe 1.1, 1.2 in outright debt and treasury instruments, maybe another 200 billion in Fannie and Freddie kinds of investments. There isn't a, another market large enough to absorb uh, some of the large investments they need to make. So do they? wish us ill in the United, no. They, they hope that we are stable. Uh, they hope that we do okay, because we're, we're of course, tied inexorably to their own long-term economic well-being. And I, I see that tapering off just a bit. Japan overtook China in a reporting period last year as being the largest investor in our debt. The UK is just under that, and the Federal Reserve somewhere just under that. So. But, but China has real issues in terms of sorting out their banks, the non-performing loans, the debt at the local government levels, and what they're going to do about structural inefficiencies that run throughout their economy. 
Yes, sir. Hi. First off, thank you for coming here tonight. It's an thank honor you. to have you. Um, my name is Mark Tatro. I'm a member of the class of 2017 here. Right and on. I want to take the talk um, on China and their human rights. I read online recently that last week or the week before, China has renounced their one child policy and they're cutting back on their labor education camps. So I was wondering if you could talk about what that kind of means for China and how China stands on hu issues of human rights. Well, they have a very weak record on human rights. And uh, justifiably, they've fallen under the criticism of a lot of other countries, including my work when I was ambassador, for which I would not receive a lot of happiness on, on their part. Uh, I had visits canceled to uh, provinces around the country because of speeches I would make on this very subject. Uh, but it's important to talk about because there, you know, otherwise are, there's no way to give voice to a lot of people who uh, are improperly diminished in terms of their own quality of life by the authoritarian nature of the Chinese regime. Uh, they changed the one-child policy. They've already changed it in the rural areas. So if you get out to places like Xinjiang and, uh, and, and uh, where there are large minority populations, now China, get this, has about 56 different minorities within the country. We tend to view it all as one. There are about 56 distinct minority groups within China. And they've always been a lot more flexible with some of the minority groups to have larger families like the Uyghur population, for example, the Hui population. Uh, but I think they've done away with it now. Now, I'm the recipient of that because my daughter, I am sure, was abandoned at two months of age because her mother, I'm guessing, would have wanted a male, not a female. When you don't have social security in your system, your daughter marries and goes away. Your son takes you in when you reach a certain age, and that's security for life traditionally speaking. So as a result, you've had a lot of abandoned girls in China. I have one such 14-year-old at home who's, who read this, I'm sure, with interest. And I, I think that I talked about Xi Jinping being pragmatic. I think they see the one-child policy as being uh, dated and uh, out of date and, and, and out, of, out of place and out of time. And same with the, with the labor camps. Just it doesn't work in today's world. And when they're talked about and discovered, and when diplomats go in and uh, point them out, it, it, in the 21st century China, that doesn't work. And I'm sure Xi Jinping is looking around the bend saying, we've got to tidy some things up, and these policies just don't work for us anymore. I'm guessing it was that sense of pragmatism that drove them to that decision. We have time for two more questions. Yes, sir, and yes, sir. Um, yes, this is regarding your comment on strategy again. And identify yourself, please. Oh, yes. I'm Stephen Hamilton. I'm a student here, um, history major, but with an IR, ma IR minor. Um, this is regarding your comments on strategy earlier. What are the one or few things that you think that America could do to get more for, for our interactions overseas, um, change how we do things in order to get better results? You say, what are the things we can learn from our, our engagement overseas? Well, ideally, we'd learn how to, how to behave in a better manner and then apply those. But what are the things that you would have us do um, to get a better reaction, I guess, or to better communicate what we want and what we're willing to give up? Well, I, I would say, again, first, learning from history and in our mistakes because we as a country also make mistakes occasionally. And I don't have to sit here and point them out because all of you in this room have lived through some in recent years that set this country back. Being um, open enough to learn from your mistakes, number one, that'll, that makes us a better country uh, when we're guided by history because history has a tendency to repeat itself and we should be informed by what has gone wrong in recent years. Number two, by what I mentioned earlier, living our values. Not just talking about values, but living our values in ways where, unspoken, you have the rest of the world say, they've got it right. They're doing what we always thought the United States would do in that case, and they're not on a soapbox preaching to the rest of the world. They're living it and doing it, which is the best example 
we could be in the world. Uh, I think that would be probably, probably another one. I'd like to see our young people engage a whole lot more in terms of study abroad programs. So I brought Chinese language, for example, to our public schools in Utah, of all places. Got to the point where, you know, kids from rural areas, you know, the, the farms, would come in and they want to play stump the governor in Chinese. And I thought, <laughs> I thought this is pretty cool. You know, they'd never been to China. Their parents had never been to China, but their parents were smart enough to know that these kids, the world they're about to step into is far more complicated and far more China-centric than the world before. And knowledge of a language like that would be a huge benefit regardless of what they chose to pursue in life. I think, I think that's going to be an important thing as well. Realizing that the millennial generation coming up, your generation, you will be engaged and you'll have to be able to operate with facility in language and culture and history and in, uh, in the traditions of other nations that earlier generations didn't have to worry about. I think it's particularly fitting that our last question and the last three have been from students at St. Anselm College, which is where we are with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, a, I'm, I'm James Glendon Larson. I'm a sophomore economics hey, major. James. Oh, howdy. <laughs> and I, I, I was curious uh, in regards to China's currency manipulation. Now, the biggest knee-jerk reaction here against tariffs and economic pr protectionism is we don't want to start a trade war. You've been critical of people who've wanted to tr have trade sanctions against China for currency manipulation. I was just curious, how would you deal with China's currency manipulation in lieu of economic sanctions? Well, it would be disingenuous then not to do the same thing with Japan, which has done the same thing to their currency recently, uh, or to India, which has done the same thing if you've watched the rupee go all the way to, I don't know, 65 to the dollar until it came back to probably 55. Uh, and the Chinese would then come back to us and say, well, the quantitative easing program that you've got, 85 billion bucks per month pumped, you're doing the same thing, it's impacting your currency too. Uh, and so we'll just go ahead and slap sanctions on you. So I say before you even start an effort where I can predict where you're gonna be at the end of the conversation, why don't we approach it a little differently? But it sounded, you know, so good on the presidential debate stage to say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and the crowd would be whipped into a frenzy. And I try to say, folks, it ain't that easy. <laughs> I, I've been part of managing this relationship, and you could hear people, boo, get that guy off the stage, you know. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to talk about serious stuff. Uh, so th these are complicated discussions that are sometimes not as they appear. And it will require students like all of you who are trying to dissect the world and learn from history and learn from culture and get out in the world to experience it, to be able to inform our future generation in the United States so that we can secure our economic destiny and our liberty and our freedom. Uh, it's in your hands, you millennials. That's why I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist because I, I think you millennials get it. I really do. So go for it and change the world. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, um, if you'd like to say hello to the governor, come on up and do so, please. Thank you all. Thank you.